Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome on the sunset safari. I'm not sure how much of a sunset we're going to have. There's some beautiful cloud in the sky. You're on a live safari here in the northeast corner of South Africa, the Kruger National Park, the western fringes thereof. My name is James Hendry. On camera we have Viam today. He's sporting a beautiful fishing hat, a um, sort of denim blue one. I think it's a good one, Viam. Well done. It's nicely camouflaged for this particular area better than mine anyway. On the other vehicle, Brent Leo Smith, the inimitable, with the equally large giraffe-like figure of Brian Joubert. Unfortunately, they're having a few technical glitches, but they will be out with us fairly shortly. Now, for those of you who... Are Oh, sorry, I thought that was Brent speaking. It wasn't speaking okay. Brent at all. Um, let me just turn that down so that I might speak with you with unfettered access. Right, you are on a live safari in case you were wondering what on earth website you've stumbled upon or what this live Ustream thing you're looking at is. You're on a live safari here in the wilds of Africa. And that means you can talk to us and indeed you are encouraged to do so. Hashtag safari live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv if you want to talk to us on the email, I think you can talk to us through YouTube. That, of course, is all social media stuff that is beyond the realms of my small brain to understand. Now, the plan this afternoon is to try and find some lions. They were found just over there this morning. We've been to check where they were lying earlier today. Scott had them trying to hunt giraffe, uh, various, not giraffe, buffalo and nyala variously during the course of the morning. They went to sleep for a while and now they seem to have headed up in this direction towards a hyena den. Brent is going to go around that side. We're going to go around here and we can see if we can find the pride. The Unkahuma pride, uh, so named after a brown ivory tree that is the name of that's what Unkuhuma means in the local language of Shitsonga or Shangan. Okay, that's the plan today. And uh, there's something else of vital importance I needed to tell you. I cannot for the life of me remember what it was. I think, um, yes, it's the weather. The weather is 32 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit and there are 7,000 million flies sitting in this car and I'm going to try and drive away from them immediately. All right. Now, we don't actually have any tracks at this stage, so we're trying to find the tracks. And of course, that's how we find animals largely out here. We find them by tracking. Uh, that means to follow their footsteps or to look for other signs they might leave. We might hear birds alarm calling. We might hear squirrels alarm calling. We might hear impala going snorting and alarm calling. We might hear kudu or nyala barking. Those are the sorts of sounds we'd be listening out for. Now, during the day, of course, lions are normally doing nothing at all, but it looked like the Nkohuma pride was a little bit hungry. And so maybe they did a bit of hunting. There was some nice cloud throughout most of the day, but like you can see here now. And so I think maybe they would have spent the day doing a little bit more than they normally do. Leopards, of course, will move during the course of the day. Lions, less so, but it's not impossible. So we're going to drive very slowly along here. I'm going to turn in towards the hyena dam and see what, at the den and see what we can see. And then we'll make a plan from there. And then, Peter, you would like to know, I was chatting about leopards. You want to know if we've had any updates on them today? Peter, I haven't heard any. I was on walk this morning, and so I didn't keep the game drive radio on but I'm pretty sure there were no updates on the leopards this morning. Right, so we're gonna drive down here. There is a hyena den down here, and it is where the tracks of the lions were heading. So we will see. Then I was walking off to the right-hand side this morning, and as we were going along, I did hear the sound of buffalo in distress. Now, buffalo will make distressed calls if they're being set upon by a pride of lions, they might always make angry noises at each other, but it sounded to me like they were being irritated by the cats. So I don't, I wouldn't wonder if the, if the lions weren't sort of in that direction, possibly even over our northern boundary. But those are the eventualities that we are facing today in our search for Africa's the largest predator. Notice I don't say greatest pre predator. Not, don't have a deep respect for lions. Vim, do you? I like lions. You like lions. Vim doesn't like buffalo, so he'd be very pleased to find a buffalo in the jaws of a lion. I know I've just seen a log. 
I know that it's a log, but I'm going to look there because something in my mind says it could be a lion's foot. I know it's not a lion's foot, but I'm unable to stop myself just having a look. Can you see what I'm looking at, Jim? Mm, I see a log. Yes. It is a log. <laughs> very nice log. Yeah, very su super, super double zoom. Yeah, well done. Mm. Well done. so funny how often that happens when you look out you see something that looks like an animal you know it's not an animal because you've done it a hundred times but it's, i'm unable to stop myself just taking the binoculars quickly to have a look i suppose better safe than sorry so we'll pop in at the den just quickly i don't want to spend too much time there before we found where those lion tracks have gone We'll have a little bit of a chat about what lions would do if they came across a hyena den. And then we will press on towards the northern boundary. If they haven't crossed the northern boundary, then we will probably have to foray in on foot to see if we can't find them. Sorry, I'm being set upon by dozens of irritating flies. Many of the other insects and arthropods have really struggled in the drought, but the flies seem to have had no problem at all with life in the drought. Hmm. Right, nothing at the hyena den, which is quite telling, to be honest. We'll just look at the ground here and check for some tracks of lions. There aren't any that I can see. I can see plenty of hyena tracks on the ground. So I don't think the lions came through here. So what would have happened if they would come through here? I'm preempting a number of questions that could happen here. Now, of course, there are definitely some young hyenas inside the den there. What would happen if lions came through this area? I've seen lions come through this clan's den before, not this particular den, but one further off to the west there. And what happens is they come in and the babies scarper down into their little tunnels. The adults will disappear off and melt into the bush and probably watch from a distance. And the lions can do nothing about it. They won't be able to get into the holes to get the youngsters. They won't be able to catch the adults who will melt off into the bush. And so it's a really clever security system. They don't have to worry too much about the smell around here. Although a hyena den doesn't normally smell too bad, they don't have to worry about calling um, and attracting the lions and worrying about that because it's such an effective way of keeping the youngsters safe and also the adults. So that's what would have happened had they come through here. I don't think they did. This is a series of four drainage lines that feed into one that feeds the Juma Dam. And I think that they are probably two or three along from here. Now, Tom, Tom, you're in Dallas and you've obviously been watching for some time. You want to know if this den is north of the camp, i.e. between Mbubu Road and Gallego Shortcut. It is indeed, Tom, it's precisely where it is. So I don't know how many of you have an idea of where we are. You can actually, you know what, if you want to, you can find a map on Google Maps. I noticed it the other day. Google Maps actually has the names of the roads here on it. How that is the case is beyond me, but they do. So you can actually go straight to Juma on Google Maps and you will find the names of the roads and so you'll understand what Tom's talking about. The camp is due behind us. We're heading due north now. Mbubu Road is to the east and then there's a series of beautiful drainage lines why we went walking in there this morning between here and Gallagher Shortcut which is the next road along. And that's where Brent's going to be heading if and when he manages to sort out the technical glitches he has with the fluid head. If you don't know what a fluid head is, I didn't until very recently either. It's the thing that the camera rests on. It's what allows the camera to pan smoothly from side to side. Also known as a pan and tilt. Also known as a pan and tilt. Thank you very much for that, Vim. Well done. It's been quite vocal the last few days as our Vim. It's rather refreshing. Now, Donna, 
you are on Twitter and you have asked a very astute question, not about the lions or the hyenas, but about the local people that live outside the, the reserve and you want to know how they're faring in the drought. Donna, um, I haven't done a huge amount of research uh, of late as to what's going on out there, but I can tell you that the cattle are in a bad way. They're definitely suffering hugely. I think that water will become more and more difficult to come by, which means that people who do water collection, so nobody in the villages out here have got, nobody has got water pipes to their homes by their municipality. There are water points around the villages where people have to go and collect water. But what will happen is that some days there will be no water in those taps at all. So they'll either have to collect sufficient on the day that, days that there are water, or they'll have to pay for people to go and fetch water at nearby villages where there is water flowing. And that, of course, has enormous cost implications, especially for people where there is a 70% unemployment rate in some regions. So, I mean, it is, it's pretty dire. It is very rough times out there, but mainly because the cattle are probably going to start dying soon. And that's a real issue, because a lot of people's wealth and investment is in cattle. There is a buffalo lying on the road. He looks rather too relaxed to have been seeing tangoing with lions. She may have run down here after a brief dalliance with the cats. We'll just ooze slowly closer to him and rusty. Hello, old fellow. Don't get up on our account. We'll just keep an eye out here. Obviously, there are no lions right around here, otherwise he wouldn't be here. But he is looking a little bit alarmed. So, a gash on his back, backside there, Liam. I don't see anything. Okay. Not really normal for a buffalo to get up and move like that, that far off the road um, initially. Certainly we got close to him, yes, so maybe he's had a bit of a stressful time of it. Lions chasing you, of course, will definitely elevate your stress levels. Not so, Bill. Yeah. yeah. I would guess so. I would guess so. Elephants have clearly been through here, eating zizifus. Those are the trees that are strewn about the road here. Let's just drive very carefully through here and check for any tracks that there might be. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, with all of the drought comes a lot of dust, and that tends to get into some of our noses, and then into our throats via our noses, which is a disgusting thought. Sorry about that. Hello, Ashley in England. You've had a prolonged absence from us for a little while and you want an update as to what's been going on. Well, here it goes in one minute, Ashley. Yes, indeed, we did have a cheetah. Karula, we don't know. We saw her two nights ago. She looked all right to us. Don't know if she has cubs or not. Then the lions in Kahuma Pride has been back. They have killed a buffalo just off to the eastern side of the reserve. They've come back into this area. They had a drink this morning. They had a play this morning. They tried to kill something else this morning. And now they're probably sleeping up here. Uh, what else has been going on? The weather has been beastly hot, except for the last two days. It's been very pleasant for the last two days. But we are looking, staring down the barrel of a 40 degree plus day tomorrow and another one then on Saturday. So it has been very hot, Ashley, and with very little rain at all. In fact, we had 0.2 millimeters of rain the other day. That on the scale of inches doesn't even register. So actually, that's the basic update of been what's going on. Some elephants around the place and scattered herds of buffalo. 
and I think that this scattered herd of buffalo are a result partly of being harassed by the lions, whoops, and partly because the grazing is now scattered. There's very little to eat. And so instead of, although the water is still concentrated, the grazing is now scattered all over the place. And so I think you will find that the lions, at least the buffalo too, have stopped concentrating. I can't concentrate anymore. The flies are attacking. I think they like this dark color. get that question from Steph on YouTube. About my favorite animal. About your favorite animal. Would you like to elaborate? I like leopards. Call me leopards. Or lions. Leopards and lions. Maybe some cheetah. Some cheetah. Servals. Servals. Not a buffalo. Yeah. Something like buffalo. Okay. Nice facial expression. <laughs> what lines are there? There you go, Steph. There's an impala in there. Underneath that Balanites tree. The Balanites tree is a torchwood tree, and Steph and I and David were under... Oh, well, you can't even see him. Let me go back a little bit. There you can see his face. Now, he just looks like he's looking a bit alarmed by life, but he's not alarm calling. Now, when we were standing underneath that tree this morning, I heard the buffalo bellowing just to the south of the tree there. So I don't know what's going on. We're just going to quickly check along here and see if there are any tracks going across. And if not, we'll make a foray in there on foot once Brent comes live. I think what that impala is doing is actually eating the fruit. Eating the fruit of those, of that torchwood tree. And the torchwood tree, of course, is renowned, supposedly, for having a flammable oil in the seed. I have yet to find this flammable oil in the seed. I have embarrassed myself on a number of occasions by attempting to burn a seed and just uh, ended up sort of burning my fingers, literally and figuratively, which is just a bit embarrassing, really. I see no tracks of lions. So maybe they are still in there. Anyway, time will tell. It is a very sticky block to get into in a car, so I'm not sure. We'll, we'll give it a go, maybe, but we'll have to find them first. We don't want to go and track them in the vehicle because that will do probably too much damage. The idea is to, when we go off-road, it doesn't seem to do any long-term damage. In fact, 30 years of off-road driving in this area hasn't done any damage. But at the same time, we don't want to go off-road and this is a confirmed sighting. So while Brent is not around, I'm not going to go in on foot. We're not going to go and track in the vehicle. We'll just keep tracking in the vehicle. I think Brent is hailing me. Why are you doing that? Ah. Go ahead, Brent. Brent, I've checked in Volvo and I've checked the fire break. I've got nothing here. I haven't heard any tracks either. The fire break is quite hard, but I don't think I would have missed them. Um, so I think this is in the block then. So Brent's going to come. Watch your heads, everybody. Brent's going to come up this way. He is now mobile. So I might take a short foray into that block on foot and see what we can find. But before I do that, I'm just going to quickly drive along the northern boundary there and see if there aren't any tracks going across. But that'll be easier to tell than on this road. This road's got a bit of a crust on it from those 0.2 millimeters of rain that we had the other day. Right, without my telling you any further what Brent's going to do for the afternoon, head across to him, jump on the car with him, and he will tell you himself, and I will see you perhaps with some good news just now. Welcome on today's Sunset Safari, and you 
our regular viewers will notice we are back in the Jigger, who has had a miraculous return of a recovery from the auto doctor. And we're going to help James find these lines. My man, Mwah! I've been running around, we've been trying to fix tripod heads, and I'm a little bit flustered, so let me just start again. Hi, my name's Brent Leo Smith. I have Brian Joubert on camera. Uh, we are helping James look for lions, and uh, we are back on our normal safari vehicle. So, very excited. We're not be, we will not be driving around in the tractor-like sounding tracking vehicle. So, hopefully, we'll find these lions in not too long. Apparently, according to Nikki and Scott, while they were walking today, they heard what sounded like lions chasing zebras. So it is possible that these lions have managed to snack or catch a zebra during the day that might have stumbled upon where they were resting. So hopefully, we'll be able to locate that. So James has been checking the north and eastern section. We're going to, coming from the south, going to check the western boundary of the block they were in this morning. Big Safari Live, welcome to Daniel, who's a new viewer on YouTube. Uh, hi, Daniel, and welcome on the back of the vehicle with me today. Uh, Daniel has proposed a very interesting question, saying, do we use drones to find wildlife? Not normally, Daniel, but watch this space. We are looking at a whole bunch of different technology to aid in the search of animals, and also the filming of animals. We do use drones to film wildlife, and more often than not, we found the wildlife on terra firma and then send the drone up. But with the way technology is developing at such a rapid speed, uh, who knows, maybe in a few short months, weeks even, we might be using a drone to find wildlife. So I know Scott left the lions probably lying about 150 meters to the east of me here. This road is quite hard, so I'm just going to go very slowly. And forgive me for not making eye contact, because I am looking for the footprints of the big cats. So far, only buffalo footprints and some old Ellie footprints. But on this hard surface, we need to look at that little bit harder at the ground to make sure we don't miss a track. That's why I am moving at a speed I could probably walk faster than. So quite often we're going through a little dip here, and this is uh, a little donga, which is a very South African word, which is another name for sort of a dry creek bed or drainage line. And quite often on either side of these are massive animal paths uh, that are utilized. And lions really like walking through paths, or walking down paths. So we're just going to check very carefully. Quite a lot of footprints of other animals so far. Welcome to Landon. Landon is also watching on YouTube and joining us on the back of the safari vehicle. Landon is wondering, do the lions have tracking devices on them? No, Landon, we're just that good at tracking them. So in an area like this, none of the, the animals have tracking devices that are used to follow up for uh, safari purposes. So when we find the animals, it's through the good old fashioned following of footprints. And it would be cheating if we put tracking devices on, take half the fun out of it for us. So 
Now, the area they are in is notoriously difficult. It is a myriad of about seven or eight of those little creek systems. Some of them uh, sort of five, which is probably over 20 foot deep, five meters, 20 foot deep. So they might be snoozing in the shade in one of those deep crevices. And Safari Dean, who's one of our regular comedians, says, don't worry, Brent. No need about tracking. Uh, we can just stare at your safari button. Sorry, guys. Oh, Ephraim's much quicker on the trigger than I am. And apart from the... Apart from Safari Dean finding himself quite funny, the only other people who think he's funny are the girls in the final control. I'm only joking, of course. You're very funny. So, again, the lines weren't too far from where we are now, but just below here is one of those little, almost ravines that I was talking about. So if we don't get any tracks, I think it might be worth a wonder to see if I can grab a lion by its tail and pull it out for you. I'm only joking, of course. What I mean is I'll go on foot, and walking on foot, you're able to hear a lot more and much easier to see the tracks. You can go at a much more steady pace. And quite often, it is the best way to find the big cats, lion or leopard. There's been a lot of impala walking down this road. There's always the chance that the lions moved early enough and the impala have come across and the buffalo as well and obliterated the tracks. But even though it's been quite overcast today, it is still very warm, uh, probably well into the 80s Fahrenheit, 30 odd degrees Celsius. So of course, uh, James wanting to take all the glory is jumping off the vehicle to go tracking now of course hindering me from doing so. So another question from Landon, and Landon, we encourage you to keep asking questions. Landon would like to know how many animals or how many lions are in the pride we're looking for currently. And there are five females, four adults, one sub-adult, although she's getting so big, she's nearly an adult as well. They are known as the Inkahuma pride. Nope, that is just a very large hyena track. So, Landon, they are known as the Inkahuma pride. They are the pride of lions we see the most regularly. And they sort of, they fall under the domination of the male lion coalition called the Birmingham Males, which is made up of five males. So if we wanted to be precise, we would say there are actually 10 lions, but there are only five currently uh, in this area. The males are off defending their eastern boundary against any marauding males, and also probably mating with the sticks lionesses. So male lions can have multiple prides that they lord over where there's the females, even though they have the same group of males, will sometimes fight amongst each other. Now, the Inkahuma pride uh, is a wonderful, it's a wonderful name, it's a Shangan word for the brown ivory tree. I'll keep a lookout for a brown ivory tree to show you. So the first time they were seen uh, some years back was under a brown ivory tree. And this, of course, is not for fact, but I think they're an offshoot of the Talamati pride, which is the pride I haven't seen before, but a much bigger pride that is to the north of us. And the reason I say this is because they have been recorded sharing giraffe and hippo and buffalo kills with that pride. And if they were unrelated females, they would probably battle it out. So there's a very good chance that they are uh, related. And because what happens when lion prides get very big, depending on the time, uh, like at the moment, you probably find the prides are going to increase while we go through a drought. And there's something the lions would love to find. A baby kudu. Where's your mother, little one? 
No, it doesn't mean mom's not around. Could you are one of those, oh, off, off it goes. Animals, for every one you see, there's probably two or three you don't. But normally with our eyesight, we do spot them. And I'm not seeing any, and I'm wondering, did those lions possibly, oh, no, Brian is found. Oh, there we go. And it's another young one. Ah, oh, there's the adult. If we go forward, we can see Mother Dearest. But as often happens with Kudu, if you just take that little bit longer and check for a few seconds more, you'll start seeing them appear out of the bush. There we go. So if we stayed and looked and there wasn't an adult around, it's possible that the lions might have chased them and they might have been split up in the pandemonium. But looking at that female, watching her body language, she looks quite relaxed. So Landon, back to your question. As uh, you, you are a new viewer and we like to get you caught up with the lion dynamics. So about a year ago, the Nkuma Pride were actually nine, uh, nine lions. Uh, there were eight lionesses or females and one young male. There are now only five. So the one young male has dispersed, he's left. Uh, one of the sub-adult females and two of the adult lionesses were killed by the Birmingham males. And that is not uncommon during coalition takeovers for the male lions to kill females and, and male, other male lions. And the reason for this is that generally in such a heightened state of aggression that the slightest slip uh, that would be completely ignored why they're the dominant animals uh, will be reacted on. And because they're so busy fighting and chasing and whatnot, that they sometimes accidentally kill females. Also, those females had those two young sub-adults, and as well as that young male, so they were trying to defend their youngsters to make sure that their sort of genetic line continues through. So Leo Pad on the same sort of tilt as uh, Landon's question. He says, well, the Nkuma Pride have been mating for quite a while with the Birmingham boys. Now, often it's very good to just stop and listen for a few seconds. Your ears often find animals for you way before your eyes do. And Leo was wondering, well, are we going to see cubs soon? Leo, in my opinion, no, not, not soon. So what happens when a Pride takeover takes place, uh, and now that the Nkumas have accepted the new males, the Birmingham boys, they will mate with them, and sometimes for two, two, up to two or three cycles. And all these cycles will be false estresses. And the reason for that is that they're not sure the Birmingham boys are going to be the big bosses in this area just yet. So normally they'll wait up to about six months uh, before they actually get pregnant by these lions. And I don't think this is a conscious decision. This is an uh, evolutionary sort of adaption that lions and leopards do. So when a new male takes over an area, there'll be quite a few false estresses before they accept that new male. So very, very interesting. And so I think, in m my opinion, guessing, the first time we're going to see cubs from the Nkumas is probably going to be close to September, October. And we might find a very strange animal while we're driving around the edge of this block that the lions have disappeared into. It's a, a, bipedal, a bipedal, ape like creature that has been known to strum a guitar and woo a lady or three. sometimes known as Commander Bond, sometimes known as the Dachshund, but normally known as James Hendry. So Shannon, Welcome on the back of the vehicle, Shannon. Shannon is wondering what would happen if the Sticks and Kahumas were to meet up. 
well, there would be a big fight. And then Kahuma's having more adult females at the moment would definitely come out the victors. Now, I was chatting to Peter, who's a guide at Nkoro, and the one sticks lioness is apparently suffering quite badly with some injuries. And he says it was when the Nkahumas arrived there, and it looks like the Nkahumas gave some of the sticks girls a good hiding. Uh, her injuries were quite bad, but often what we consider to be devastating injuries is something a lion will get over in a couple of weeks. They have amazing, amazing constitutions and are able to recover from massive gashes in, in a very, very short time. So, we're looking for one of the biggest predators. Now, there's one of the smallest predators and not of the mammalian variety, of the avian variety. We got it by? On this, oh. Oh, it has disappeared. It's, uh, sorry about that. Uh, birds tend to fly away when you try to put a camera on them. Uh, that was a red-backed shrike. And on Bushwalk with Scott, it was yesterday evening, you would have found a dung beetle impaled on a thorn, and that is the culprit. I'm trying to see if I can spot it again. No, it's disappeared. Fortunately, there are quite a few around, so I will have another look for red-backed shrikes as we continue on. And they are one of our migrants. And the majority of the ones that come visit us come from Europe. So any of our viewers who might live in Europe might have actually seen the exact same redback shrike that we see on safari. Since we're on the hunt for lions and chatting in depth about them, Susan in New York, thanks for joining us, Susan, is wondering, are there different species of lions? Now, this is an argument that's been going on since there have been scientists studying lions. And there are, I think, about eight recognized or semi-recognized different subspecies of lions. And the more genetic research is done, the more those subspecies are debunked. And it probably turns out that there's only one species of lion in Africa, although there have been some unique genetic markers found in the only non-African lion population. So there are two species of lion. You have the African lion, which is the one we're on the hunt for, and you have the Asiatic lion, which is in completely sequestered into the Gear Forest National Park uh, in India. And there have been removed from the rest of the range. Remember, lions used to live in Greece, in Italy, in France. And that was quite a long time ago, and humans have removed them from said parts. Also, the temperate forests of Europe are not ideal lion country, so they would have occurred in relatively no, low numbers. Now, a lot of... Standing by. Nothing so far, James. Um, on the shortcut, off the shortcut, about to head to the Buffalo Sock boundary, I'll go back and check the top half of the shortcut. Now, there's something to confuse most people when giving directions. But fortunately, we do know what we're talking about. There's a little bit of confusion about the roads in this area. There is a Gallego shortcut. Now, there's a shortcut that comes off Gallego shortcut to go past Gallego Pan. And a little bit beyond that, there's the shortcut off Gallego shortcut to the Buffalo boundary. So I hope everyone understood that. We're going to continue on, on the shortcut off the shortcut to go back round and join the other side of the shortcut. So we were chatting about those lions quickly. So uh, a lot of people in the North Americas and even South Americas uh, will say, but what about a mountain lion? Now, a mountain lion is not a lion. It just happens to have a similar coloring to a lion. 
So if we, it is far more closely related to leopard, both in size and genetics. So it's more of a, a, a sort of American leopard than it is an American lion. Not to say that lions didn't occur in um, the Americas, but not uh, the same type of lions that we got here. You did have cave lions, which were very similar to saber-toothed cats, but from a bit, a bit, old, uh, a bit younger than a saber-toothed cat. So we're just going to carry on checking along here very carefully for any sign of those lions. And while we do that, Commander Bond, or the Dashunt, is standing by to give you an update. Hello everybody, we just drove down this little game path to have a look. I went in on foot quite a long way into the block and unfortunately I didn't even come up with one track. So I really don't know what on earth these lions have done. This is not the path we came in on, it's over there. Never mind, we'll get out here. Um, and I walked to exactly where I heard those buffalo shouting this morning. I don't know what's happened to them. I think that one that we saw there had possibly been harassed by them. Anyway, so what we're going to do now is sort of do a, a wider route around the place and see if we can't find some evidence, some tracks. Like I say, I went into this block pretty much as far as we able, would have been able to drive there are parts of it that you just cannot drive. So we're going to go towards Sydney's Dam now, see what's there, and then come back into the area on a sort of wider arc. If that's all right with you. It's still obviously very, very dry, so there will be some thirsty animals around. So maybe there'll be something interesting at the dam, even if it isn't the lions. I could easily have missed the tracks going across this road. It's not easy to see on a road like this. But I think they're still in there, you know. I think they are still in the block. Gracie. Gracie, for everybody, anyone who doesn't know, is aged eight. And um, <laughs> we said we made a little uh, we made a little mud doll for her a little while back. And she had a little bit of trouble over at home. And so we thought we'd send it over to her. And all the way from Buffles Hook Dam, uh, the doll now named Safari James has made it all the way to Ohio and Gracie it is my pleasure to send it to you you do not have to give him back he is yours forever and ever and I hope you do enjoy him and I hope that you look after him he's, he's quite delicate you know he Viam and I made him and the, he's not um well I wouldn't say that he's a work of art because I'm particularly poor at art but he's certainly got character so look after him carefully you say that you haven't held him yet, but you have got a picture of him, so you're obviously going to see him very soon, and I hope that when you do eventually hold him, you will be transported here to Africa, where, from which, or from which place he emanates with a great deal of love. So I hope that you enjoy him, and I'm very glad that you've seen a picture of him and that you're obviously feeling a bit better. MP, did you ever think that our art would make it all the way across the world? I don't even know you said that. Yeah, well, there we go. We've probably broken a number of laws, of course. I was thinking just that. Yeah, I'm not sure that the bacteria of Buffalo's Hook is quite ready to go on an extended holiday to the United States, but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's okay. okay. I'm just going to look at a pile of stones that I know isn't a lion. That isn't a lion, is it, Liam? No, it's too stony for a lion. You know, yes, that's exactly what I'm looking at. 
Langdon or Landon, you are watching on YouTube, I think, for the first time. And you want to know how dangerous it is to be in the bush. Langdon, um, I, I don't like to think that it's dangerous at all. I think it is potentially dangerous, but I mean, so is living in a city potentially dangerous. If you know what you're doing, if you have the right training, if you know how to react to animals when you see them, then being out here is not dangerous. Some people would like to uh, tell you otherwise, um, certainly those in, mm, who like to make out that they have a tremendously heroic and, and uh, physically dangerous and taxing job. Uh, those who wear enormous knives on their belts, for example, they might like to tell you that this is a particularly dangerous job. It is not, Langdon. It is like anything in the world. If you know what you're doing out here, it's not particularly dangerous. It's far more an immersive and beautiful nature experience. And that's what we're doing when we're going off on foot and trying to find things. Yes, you do have to be careful, of course, all the time. But you have to be careful anywhere in life, really, unless you're cosseted away somewhere. So, no, I wouldn't describe it as particularly dangerous. It certainly ain't like... Um, well, there's a lot more dangerous things to do. For example, leaping off a mountain in a in a squirrel suit. That's dangerous. Can you say, Ben, would you leap off a mountain in a squirrel suit? Absolutely. You would? Okay, okay. you're mad then. I wouldn't. Right, we're going to go on to the Bifflesook cut line, head across to Sydney's Dam, then we'll come down Aubrey's Road, which is just to the west of where we're looking now, and see if there aren't any tracks there. Otherwise, we might come back into this area. Otherwise, I don't want to spend the whole afternoon looking for things that we ain't going to find, especially if they might be in a block where there's somebody talking to me. Link to Brent, warthog. Ah, Brent has a warthog. Let us link across to him. I will find out what's going on with my radio and we'll see you shortly. So we're with that one part of the little warthog family we've been seeing regularly around Sandy Patch and Sydney's. And we can only see one female and two youngsters. Normally there's, there are five little piglets and two females, the other might, others might not be too far off. But as we were discussing with this exact little sounder, but when there were a few more of them, I'm just gonna try slide forward slightly. That warthog sounders are quite often, when you have more than one adult, made up of mother and her daughters. And they're one of the few herbivores that actually practice aloe suckling. So the youngsters will be able to suckle off mom, aunt, or even grandmother in certain circumstances. But little, life for a little warthog is quite tenuous. Now, a favorite of many of the big cats. The female warthogs can be very aggressive in their defense of the little ones. They start feeding on grass after about two weeks, the little guys, although they will continue to suckle till they're about six months old. You can even hear them munching away. And at the moment, they should be surrounded by lush green grass that's higher than them. As you can see, the drought taking quite a severe effect. And you can see that little, that warthog has dropped to her knees. And she'll use that nose to dig out even the bulbs and tubers. That are under the ground. And look how she We've seen elephants do it often and move fallen down trees and branches to get to little titbits that have been forgotten. And there we go. Watch as she moves those fallen sticks that something like an impala might not do. So you've got to use every trick you've got. 
as a herbivore to survive these harsh climates. And Anne Telope is wondering what animal is going to adapt best to these incredibly dry climates outside obviously the carnivores who think it's Christmas all over again. And look at that. Now there we've seen she's quite an old female warthog and moving the branches to get to some little succulent spots that the impala might have possibly looked over. Now Anne, in my personal opinion, it's probably going to be the impala that adapts best. And that's one of the reasons impala is the most numerous antelope in Africa, because of their adaptability. And the main reason is that they're able to graze, so eat grass as well as browse. So they'll take advantage of any leaf as well that will provide any form of sustenance. So that's one of the reasons impala are the most numerous antelope. And I think they will probably adapt best. I don't think any of the herbivores are going to have a great time of it for the next year, possibly, unless we get some early rain in November. But I think we might get a little bit more rain before we set into dry season proper, but not enough to rectify the fact that we've had no rain, almost no rain up until now. So we often see warthogs on their knees and you can see there's a very prominent pad. There we go, on cue, good little piggy. And those hardened pads actually start developing when they're still in the womb. So obviously they're hardened as they are used and become more calloused. But that thickened skin on, on the front knees, enabling warthogs to feed on their knees, actually starts developing when they're still in the uterus. But piggies, let's leave them be. We've got lions to find. We're just going to have a quick gander at Sydney's water hole see if there's possibly not a herd of elephants or buffalo having a drink and then we're going to head back towards the last set of lion tracks. So as we head further and beyond into the new year, obviously the light changes, it gets darker earlier and lighter later and Pamela is wondering what time does it get dark in the Sabi Sands at the moment. I'd say it's probably pitch dark just after 7 p.m., uh, but dark enough that we need to start using spotlights uh, from about quarter to six, uh, and also obviously depends on the cloud cover. And we've had a few cloudy days. I mean, yesterday we had to use a spotlight from about half past six, but that was due to the cloud uh, blocking out the sunlight. giraffe in the distance. So Sydney's waterhole falls beyond our northern boundary. So we have long vistas from here and there looks to be, from what I can see for the moment, I will check carefully now, just that single giraffe. There's a male giraffe. From this distance, I can't see if it's the one we've been regularly seeing, showing his amorous intent with the local ladies. Those look to be walking with purpose, and that's where the giraffe's name comes from. It's a derivative of the Arab Arabic word zarafa, the one who walks swiftly. It's going to disappear into the taller trees and popping out again. But moving away from our Travis area, so we are going to do the same. And we're going to go back into that area where the last set of lion tracks were uh, while we do that. James has got the second largest truffle legged in the Greater Kruger National Park. Now, 
we had some little kudu here with a cow, but they have absconded. They stood so beautifully framed. And then as you came live, they disappeared there. There's Mrs. Kudu. It's a tiny... Oh, I think you saw a kudu in its calf with Brent earlier. It might be the same one. It's possible. Can you see those again? A little bit. There they are. There they are, running through here. The, there are three of them together, and the two youngsters are not the same age as each other. That's the smallest one there. That's the middle one there. And then there's an adult cow with them, too. I suspect quite strongly that the two youngsters are siblings and that the adult cow has just had that little one. And perhaps the second, the middle one, is just kind of hanging around still with its mum. There's the little one you can see, much smaller, about the size of a bushbuck, really, so probably only a few weeks old. It's very sweet, look at it. Hmm. And could you, a bit like some of the other large antelope, like roan and sable, which, of course, we don't get here anymore, and possibly even Eland. I'm not sure what Eland do. They leave their little babies in hidden, and the waterbuck actually do the same thing. They leave their babies hidden for a few days in the thick bush, and they have no scent. And they do that so that the adults can go off to water where they can drink and then come back and feed the youngsters without having to risk the youngsters by taking them towards water. Now, of course, they don't live in the same size herds as impala, which means they don't have the same level of vigilance. They're unable to spot predators quite as well as a big herd of impala, and so they leave their babies whenever there is a risk of them being caught, perhaps, or seen by predators. And predators will concentrate around water, especially in a drought like this. It's rather a clever strategy. astute question coming through here about, well, actually, we were just talking about dung, Viam and I. He was saying how his cat is a huge fan of elephant dung and that when he goes on leave, he takes him a special ball of elephant dung and the cat rolls around in the elephant dung and really enjoys it. I've never heard that before. Um, and Claudia, on the subject of dung, you want to know about whether, how important the feces of the herbivores is to the fertility of the landscape here. Claudia, the answer is massively, massively important, especially the large grazing herbivores like buffalo and like elephant. They make an enormous difference to the fertility of an area like this. And I think that you will find that we probably don't have nearly as many buffalo as we used to in an area like this, and possibly not nearly as many elephants either. And I think that probably has affected the fertility of the land. Seen him. Uh, sorry. Yes, but we have. There she goes. Forward. So Claudia, hugely important. And without the, without that fertilizer, you would find that the grasses and trees really struggled, but mainly the grasses. Buffalo dung is especially impressive. Go ahead, Brent. Brent is just hailing me. Uh, where are you taking your driver? You can hear him now. Brent, I did Aubrey's Road. I'm on Voyatella Access now. I'm just going to check that they haven't come across here. Uh, VM thought he may have seen a track. I don't know if it was from this morning, though. I'm coming. I'm going to check the Sydney. I'm heading back to the Delaware. Yeah, Brent, now. I haven't done yet. Copy that. So we're just kind of circling a bit wider now. Scott is also coming into the area. He, of course, had the lions this morning, so he might be better equipped to tell us where they've gone. But that block, like I say, is very thick, and so we, he, they probably, they may not be far from where he left them, but to be able to drive into where, beyond where he left them, will be impossible. And that's okay. I think it's quite nice to have areas that we can't get into in the vehicles. Hello, R2. 
tea everything. You are fast being categorized along with a number of other viewers in the category of doubting Thomas. Now, you are wondering whether this is really live, and especially since we were just looking at Brent, and how could it possibly be live if you're now looking at me? Well, RT, it is very much live, as evidenced by the fact that I'm speaking to you after you ask your question. It is a valid question. And the way that this works is that we have two vehicles out at the moment, and then we have a final control room in which Kirsten and I think who is with Kirsten at the moment? Oh, Leanne. Kirsten and Leanne are sitting. They are taking your questions, and Kirsten is watching two screens so she can see exactly who's seeing what. So if Brent is seeing something good, then she'll swip, swip across to him. And if I'm seeing something good, then she'll swap across to me. And if you send through a question, she'll send it through to my ear. And that's how it all works. So we're very much live, Artie, and we're very pleased to have you along. And thank you for asking a question of us. But do not doubt that we are live. We are very, very live and alive, aren't we, Viam? Yeah, well. Yes. Now, this is where Viam had his track this morning, and they did it. Not this morning, this afternoon, but may have been from this morning. So let's just check carefully. You'll excuse me if I don't look you in the eye. driving around looking at some of the most magnificent trees on planet Earth, for example, the Marula tree, a great famous wondrous tree. You're wondering about diseases that might affect trees. Ashley, I'm just going to stop here and listen and see if we can't get any sign of um, alarm calls. But Ashley, you want to know if any diseases affect our trees? Because they affect trees, obviously, in the UK and they affect them in various parts of the world. Not that I know of amongst the um, wild trees here. I have seen the odd disease. They get a kind of um, the oak trees, for example, in Johannesburg, which are not indigenous, but they get a terrible disease. They get a kind of white mildew that grows on them, and that really causes a problem for them. And I've seen one or two trees out here. I think it's some of the marulas actually get a kind of blight on them. But there's nothing that's too severe, nothing that we're, we're worried about, and certainly nothing at the moment that's making me worry too much about the ex, you know, some of the trees going extinct. But what I would, wouldn't mind is if anybody out there can tell me if there are any diseases that are a particular risk to our indigenous species, I would be very interested to know. I, I've got a slight feeling in, my, in the back of my mind that there is one disease that I'm missing out. I've got a picture in my mind of a tree with some blackened leaves on it uh, from the Palabora region, and I don't know if that was an indigenous tree or not. But there's nothing in the, in the news at the moment, there's nothing that we're particularly worried about right now. Thank you, Ashley. Good question. The biggest threat to the tall trees in a drought time like this, of course, is elephants. They will push a lot of them over. Again, that's not a train smash just how things are out here. So I'm watching the road very carefully for track signs of the lions walking across, running across, chasing something. But they did chase a buffalo towards this area this morning. In fact, in Nyala, I think it was. So we'll just very carefully drive down here. Mm. You see them there? Yeah. Going where? That way. Now, Viam Dorenbrach, who's supposed to be filming, reckons that he can see tracks of the lions coming across here. Viam, are you sure? I'll take this I believe you. I'm just worried that I can't see them. Catch, while I go and look at these tracks in Tampa, you're wondering about when the last time I saw a male lion was. I can't
can't remember the last time I saw a male lion here. The Birmingham boys don't seem to be particularly worried about this particular end of their territories because it's not being pressurized. So they're much more concerned further south. BMB? Yes. Have I gone blind? I'm standing on top of them now. <laughs> well, they were certainly around here, but how fresh these are, I don't know. What do you think, Vim? Do you think during the course of the afternoon or this morning? Here's one here. Right, there's one definitely here, and I don't know if they came this far up this morning. What we will do, I think it's definitely worth going down the western edge of quarantine clearings and see if we can't pick up something there. Because these are definitely tracks. Well done, Viam. So, male lions, I'm not sure when the last one I saw here was. I saw one at Londolozi a little while back. That was our old friend, the Matimba boys. They, um, they, of course, don't come here anymore. Now, Brent is also off the vehicle, so I suspect he just walked into this block, just like I did. And perhaps he'll bump into the Inkahuma Pride. I've just got a nasty suspicion that these tracks are from this morning when they were chasing the buffalo around here. But, in the absence of a better idea, let's just head around and see. And then, of course, I'll have to eat enormously humble pie, which will be un proved to be correct. Well, I'm not sure I'll eat my cap. It's quite a grubby thing. So, Kat, I'm sure that the male lions will eventually return back here. And whether or not it'll be the Birmingham boys or the Salatis from north of us, I'm not sure. Now, for those of you who don't know, this area is, in theory, dominated by four male lions, five male lions, called the Birmingham Boys. Oh, hang on one second. I think that was Brent. Go again. It wasn't Brent. No. And the Birmingham Boys dominate, in theory, dominate this area. And I say in theory because they haven't come here to check the area for a very long time. And to the north of us, there are two males called the Salati males. To the south of us, there are the Matimbas who used to occupy this part of the land. And at the moment, we're kind of a sort of zone between. See any more tracks, Bim? We'll do a loop around on Zoe's road and see what we can come up with as we go. Then I think it might be time to press on and just let Scott have at the tracks. Because he had them earlier this morning. That said, there hasn't been a huge amount called in on the radio today, so it might be worth just keeping going with these. So this is quarantine clearings just off to the left-hand side, and a very drought-stricken piece of ground that is now. All the animals coming out onto the clearings during the course of the night to try and survive. Hello, Brady, you're 14, and you're also in Ohio, as is young Gracie. And you want to know if marula trees are only found in South Africa? No, they're not. They're found, I think, throughout, up into East Africa as well. We certainly get them in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Botswana, possibly even, maybe not Namibia. That's probably a bit far. Probably not quite wet enough. So, and probably into Zambia, I'm sure. So, yes, lots of countries where we get marulas. They're a very iconic tree, though. Very few fruits on them, actually. Uh, this coming in. Go again. Scott's calling. I'm just wondering which one of you will be coming. Sorry, I didn't copy that you'd located. Scott has found the lines, everyone. Uh, okay, sorry, Jeff. 
because yeah, I have located that um, best axis is off, is off the bogey and I'll put two mic mark between the water hole and gonna go shortcuts. Okay, copy that. I am a minute from there. I'll be there now. Let's go and have a look. Scott managed to find them. Come on, Rusty. Brent is off the vehicle, of course, walking about on foot, which means he's going to struggle to hear that radio transmission because he doesn't have a radio at all. That is good news indeed. That, that good news is always slightly tinged with a bit of jealousy that we didn't manage to find them. Never mind. I'll get over it eventually. So I don't know if Brent is back on his vehicle. Kirsten, is Brent back on his vehicle? Apparently Brent has a handheld. Brent, you copy Brent? Sorry, I'm just letting them know that I can't get hold of him. Right, one minute from there. Not too far from the Gallego waterhole where we first started looking. They obviously didn't go nearly as far north as I thought they had. Hold on to your drinks. Don't drip them off on your laps. Big bump. Sorry, just hold on one second. Kirsten, sorry, I didn't copy that. Go again. Apparently, Brent has also found the lions on foot. Um, so, <laughs> that's good news. He must have come in just here. Well done. Very well done. Okay, but he's quite a long way from the car, so we'll go in and he can just enjoy the fact that he found them on foot, and I did not. Now, I think. I think the area that they're in is just up here. I'm just going to call Scott again. Scott, you copy. So we confirm that semi-dead Scotia to the western side of the waterhole, northwestern side. Okay, copy. Right, there's a dead tree up there, or semi-dead tree. Hello. Hello. How are you? Are they in here? I don't know, I'm waiting. Okay. So. I think Brent's also in there. <laughs> okay. That's Nikki and Louise, everybody. They're in here somewhere. I can see them there now. From me, James, they're just a little bit further west, basically. Looks like they could be showing interest in something down in the river. I just don't really see to you, but you should catch up to them. Okay, copy that. Kirsten, if you can just get hold of Brent and tell him that he can leave the area. I've got them now. Scott has guided me in. I was looking in completely the wrong direction, of course. Now, whether we can get this car in here. showing interest in something just down in the riverbed. Put your head there. Yeah, she's got a visual. 
negative. Yeah, Liam's got them. Liam's spotted them, everyone. Liam's got them, thanks. Mate. Are they up? Yeah, Moving up. down into the drainage. Oh, there I can see them. Right, what we'll do is get a quick visual here. They're there in front of us now. They're looking for something. They're looking at something. Can you see them there? There we go. We will try and get a better view, obviously, but they're in some very thick stuff there. I suspect quite strongly that what they're looking at is Brent Leo Smith. If he is still on foot here. Of course, they don't like people on foot, you see, so they will sit up and look if people come by. This is the whole pride, the whole Nkuruma pride. We'll just move in there a little bit. Let's see if we can't get a better look. I was definitely looking completely the wrong place. They oh, do seem to be on the move, so we may or may not be able to stay with them. to extract from the area. He's, um, I've got, you know, perfect view here. Yeah, and the lions are watching you, Brent. Yeah, so the lions were definitely watching Brent. He was just down there. He was just through through the Tambuti thicket there. Anyway, now you can see they've completely relaxed. So we had some questions about what it was like to walk around with lions and what happens when you walk around with lions. Well, that's what happens. They sit up and they look at you. They're a bit nervous of us on foot. And so Brent has moved away now and you can see them all yawning and about to go back to sleep. Well, I hope they're gonna go back to sleep. Now, Leo Pad, you want to know if I've ever been charged by a lion on foot. I've had one or two lions take a few steps towards me, but I've never been um, aggressively charged in anger, no. Some people have. I haven't. I've never had to stand on a particularly serious lion charge. I'm not sure why. That's some great yawning. One of them marking some territory. I'm afraid this is probably about the best view we're going to get at the moment. It's going to be very difficult to get any closer in, and if I... I might be able to just sneak a little bit further in towards this tree here. As they go down into that drainage line, I think it's going to become very difficult. I don't think they saw Scott at all. Scott was standing probably about 50 or 60 meters from them. I think he must have snuck in here very quietly indeed. Marvelous, look how beautifully colored they are. The pride is in pretty good health now after going through some very rough times with the advent of the Birmingham boys in the area. 
but they're absolutely fine at this stage. Whiskey Bravo, you want to know how on earth we know where each other are, how we find each other. Are we working on a grid-like system or do we just recognize areas? It's the latter. Whiskey Bravo, what we do is we find, for example, Scott walked in here. He saw the lions and he, also, he told me to come towards a termite mound with a scotia tree on it. And I know that termite mound and I know the tree because we drive around here a lot. And he said, just head in a sort of northwesterly direction from there, which is what I did. And lo and behold, here were the lions. So that's how we do it. On that note, I must just call them in on the radio so that other vehicles could come and have a look. Stations, the Unkahuma Pride is static off the two track that goes to the Gallagher waterhole. If you are coming into the area, let me know and I will direct you in. Yes, it's pretty thick, about three out of five visual. All right. So I was just saying that, of course, we're on a pretty agile little vehicle, but a lot of the game drives are in much bigger cars, and to get them into these thick areas would be very difficult, which is quite nice for us because it means we get to keep the lions to ourselves. Nice to have them up there. Apparently, we're playing the whole of the morning, which is just wonderful. <laughs> Hello, Peter. We're looking at the Unkahuma Pride, and you want to know who names the animals. Well, uh, it's kind of a complex thing and often fraught with quite a lot of com uh, sort of a conflict, actually. Uh, the, this pride was named for a specific tree called the brown ivory tree, as told to me by Sarah in Ohio. Thank you for that, Sarah. And I'm not sure who gave them that name. With the leopards, of course, they are named normally by the ranger and tracker team that finds them as cubs, but that can change and some people call them some things and some people call them others and so it really does depend and then our viewers have named some animals for example the a lot of the animals in the hyena clan have been named by our viewers and i think that's great but essentially the only animals we really name and that's so that we can keep track on them are the leopards and then the lions like that one you're looking at now is quite characteristic because she's got very amber colored orange eyes and so our viewers named her Amber Eyes. But that isn't a kind of official designation, but it does make it much easier to spot, of course. Lions are doing a great deal of snoozing around this time of the day, always. But they're actually a lot more active than they are normally at this time of the day. Last time I saw them, they were eating a buffalo, a young buffalo. Hmm. Very tired. And this pride makeup is three adult females, one very definite sub-adult, and some, some argument of, uh, over the age of the fifth one. Um, I am pretty fairly convinced that, that it is a youngish lion, sort of about three. But there do seem to have been some, a sibling of the very young one in the pride that was killed by the Birmingham boys. So I'm not sure exactly of how old they all are. Ramey, you're in San Diego and you're obviously a fay with what's going on with the lions in this area and you say, why did the Birmingham boys mate um, with the Styx lions yep, yep. and not with 
the, with these lionesses. The Birmingham boys have mated with these lionesses. They've mated with at least two of them at this stage. So they are starting to mate with all the lionesses in their territory. And I suspect it won't be long before there is sort of more than one pregnant female within this pride. They don't want to be producing too many babies at one time, though. I think two females with cubs would be plenty. If they have three of them, given that only three of them are truly experienced adults, if they have three of them giving birth, I really don't think that they'd be able to feed them all for too long. So probably best that only two have cubs and they can look after them. You see, just having a little bath there. Carol, you're in South Carolina and you reckon that domestic cats are able to smile at you by blinking their eyes slowly and indicating their comfort. Carol, I don't know if lions do the same thing. I've certainly never noticed it before. I think you'll find that uh, certainly when they are relaxed, they will blink slowly and then go to sleep. Now, whether that's an indication of smiling or them trying to communicate some form of comfort, I don't know. I would doubt it somehow. Um, but they don't really have an obvious indicator of comfort. They have an obvious indicator, of course, of anger, just like a domestic cat does. Well, they'll swish their tails. They might um, growl, just like a domestic cat would. But uh, they don't purr or... I mean, I, I haven't heard that about domestic cats, that they blink slowly to indicate comfort. Nice question. Thank you, Carol. Beautiful picture there of the lioness with her white under eye. Mm. Now, Leopard, this pride is five strong. It used to be eight strong, then it was seven, obviously, and then six, and now five with the advent of the Birmingham boys. And you want to know the pride size is a function of prey availability and prey size. To a certain extent, Leo Pad, but not entirely. The size of the pride is not only dependent on what's available to eat, but in some areas, certainly like in the Kalahari, for example, where prey is far less abundant, the prides will be slightly smaller, and then you will find larger prides, well, um, prides in the Kruger, some areas up to 24 strong, sometimes up to 30 strong. They don't last very long like that because they're difficult to feed. And when in areas where they eat buffalo largely or giraffe, then the prize can get quite big. Um, but so there are other factors involved. It's not necessary for lion prides to be together to be successful. And the optimum size around Kruger seems to be around this size, five related females and their offspring. There's the youngster there, you can see with pink nose. Just got a slightly younger face as well, less battle-hardened. Right, let's head across to Brent, and I'm going to ask you to ask him to share with you the experience of seeing the cats on foot, because it is a wonderful experience, and I'm sure he will give it a wonderfully justified story. I'll see you shortly. Team effort there to get a vehicle into the Incahumas. And uh, Jamie and I were actually on foot, probably about 20 meters away from them, uh, when they stood up and they looked at us. Uh, they didn't seem too perturbed because they lay down again quite shortly and we skedaddled back to the vehicle. And we have found other strange bipedal creatures. I don't think it's the first time you've seen them. I can see one trying to run away from camera at the moment. There it is, trying to hide. There's a whole bunch of biped bipedals. Hominids. I don't know if I would go as far as to call them evolved hominids, maybe de-evolving hominids. And there we go. The tracking team. Oh, lots of 
lots of noise. There's Dangerous Dave, Louise, Nicola. There she is. And then, of course, hello. Or you be all know and love, Scott How Dyson. How the line going with James? Very well. We had a really lack of sighting on foot from in the drainage. Oh, no. Nice. We were coming from the other side. I thought they were stalking something. <laughs> it was obviously you. Yes. <laughs> um, what's your plans? Um, not much. We're going to find Shadow, though. Okay. The next I had, I had the same plan, so maybe I'll go the oh, opposite you, direction. We'll let you go first. I am going to go down towards Treehouse and then okay. maybe go east. Okay, cool. We'll head back up. Cool. Enjoy, guys. Cheers, everyone. These guys look like they were up to something naughty. There's just too much mischievous grins there. Too many? I think they were up to nonsense. I think we better watch out for a, a rubber snake falling from a tree or such other mis miscreant behavior. What do, you, what do you think, Brian? Or if not, we should have a rubber snake to put in a tree to catch them as they follow us. Safari Darlene in New Hampshire. Uh, Darlene said she was lucky enough to get a view of a bobcat and her kittens running through a field. Darlene, I'm, I'm actually quite jealous. I've never seen a bobcat and definitely something I would really love to see. And Darlene's also wondering, beyond that, are they more close uh, to a sort of a serval or a caracal? I would say they're probably closer to a caracal, which is also sometimes called a lynx, and that's just due to the long tufts of hair upon their ears. Uh, but bobcats are quite a lot sort of thicker, uh, slightly bigger than, than a caracal or serval, but the African equivalent would be the caracal, or lynx as we call it, which I think is another name for a bobcat as well. So we're going to head off towards Treehouse Waterhole and see if there's anything partaking in that seep. Hopefully the warthogs haven't soiled it again. It's so the last time I was there, I could see the warthogs had had a jolly old time cooling off, but they had also had a jolly old urination. And you could actually smell the uric acid in that water. Jamie's friend from Switzerland uh, would like to know about orchids. She said she's read there's 64 different types of orchids that occur in the low felt, uh, but she's only ever heard of the leopard orchid. Uh, well, Steph, the majority of those 64 will be grass orchids. And uh, with all the grass we have at the moment, there's going to be almost zero around. Uh, but I think, a part, I think the only true epiphyte or tree orchid in this area is uh, the leopard orchid. A lot of that 64 species of orchids will occur on grasses. Uh, I might be incorrect. I think there may be one or two orchid species uh, that are endemic to certain types of forest, especially if you head a little bit further north of here uh, to Montaji's kingdom, to the kingdom of the rain queen uh, in the forests around Toyando, uh, Zanin, uh, Lake Fundunduzi. Uh, and those forests there that are sort of on the cusp between the low felt and, uh, and the middle felt. But uh, I might be wrong, but the only orchid I know of that grows in a tree, sort of in the greater Kruger, is the leopard orchid. The only other orchids I know of are on grass species. But as I said, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. So we were chatting about how the Inca Huma Pride, who James is sitting with, got their name. 
and for the first time they were ever seen, they were reclining under this particular tree species. And this happens to be one of my favorite tree species we get here, and it's called the brown ivory, or bichima, uh, bichima discolor, also known sometimes as the bird plum. And you can see during the summer months, it has this wonderful green canopy. And the first time that pride of lions was seen was sleeping underneath one of these trees. So the Inkahuma pride is named after a brown ivory tree. And there don't seem to be any fruit just yet. Or if there have been, there might be quite a few because of the year. The marulas haven't really fruited properly either because of the drought. But if they do fruit, one of my favorite bush time snacks, incredibly sweet, very small little fruit, uh, sort of brownish yellow in color. Very, very tasty. In Zambia, they make quite a potent local beverage from it uh, that has been known to put one on one's backside. And in South African terminology, it's often referred to as, a uh, well, similar type of thing is referred to as mampur. Uh, but I think for North American terminology, uh, good old moonshine. Isabella is a curious and inquiring mind, and Isabella would like to know, do giraffe knock trees over like elephants? No, they don't, Isabella. They have that long neck, so they don't have to, and they can eat off the leaves high up. They will sometimes break certain branches. And speaking of giraffes and some of their favorite things, so that one is even a bit high for giraffe, but we see there's a nice marula tree, and in that marula tree in the thicket slightly to the left, we can see it's a bit darker. Now that is indigenous mistletoe, and it's very high in nutrients, and it's probably going to be one of the survivors of the drought because it's going to parasitize off that marula and suck the nutrients straight from the marula. And in times of drought, as we're experiencing now, often cattle herders throughout Africa will climb up the trees and chop out the mistletoe and feed it to their livestock because it's very very high in nutrients and it tends to survive and be green throughout the drought periods because it is not having to search for water and nutrients under the ground it is taking them straight from the tree it is parasitizing now mistletoe has another few uses as well it's got one of the few white latexes that is not noxious and it's very sticky and very viscous and when sort of boiled up slowly and mixed you can use it to make something called bird lime and bird lime was used by traditional hunters to catch various different bird species so they would lay it over a, a branch or a certain area and put some seeds or food or leftover food there and the birds would be attracted to that and once the bird stood into this uh, you can imagine it's basically like standing in really really tough chewing gum but deep and birds are not as strong as us and they would actually get stuck in the bird line and then the hunter would come past once a day twice a day to remove the birds that they have caught but quite, quite interestingly, the hunters had quite a hard time, and especially in certain areas, I have seen it actually used in northern Botswana and in, 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 in western Zambia. And there was, in both cases, it was the same species of bird, an African goshawk, who learnt about this and used to wait for the bird hunters to catch the birds in the bird line, and then the goshawk would just come and grab a free meal. So now that we've had a cheetah around, I've been checking all the tops of termite mounds very carefully. The cheetah like to defecate up high. It's a very diagnostic sign of cheetah dung. In the Kruger, they like to do it on top of all the road signs. So we're just double checking. 
no cheetah dung atop that that particular termite mound, but we will be keeping a, a lookout. We haven't found any tracks of that cheetah leaving, so it is possible it's still a tumor. He is a little bit nervous, but uh, hopefully if we do find him again, we'll be able to have a nice sighting. in New York is wondering why do I think birds are so skittish because obviously they have the advantage of flight and can escape at the last second but Alan you must remember we're not the only things that hunts a bird and the biggest threat to a lot of other birds are birds like I was speaking about African goshawk little kabar goshawks uh, African hawk eagles all are great feeders on other AV fauna so rather in out in the African bush, rather err on the side of caution if you want to live to see the next sunrise. So it's more than likely the fact that we're not the only predators and any form of predator will actually cause the birds to be slightly nervous. So we're gonna start heading towards the treehouse waterhole while we do that. Let's go back to Commander Bond who's with some kitty cats. Now, I hope, I'm sure Brent gave you a wonderful impression of what it's like to see lions on foot, any cat on foot, of course, and no one better to tell you about that, of course, than the inimitable Brent Leo Smith. Well, their lions have not moved. We have moved slightly closer to them, given the fact that they were so fast asleep, they didn't react to us at all, and we're now sitting actually only about, hmm, probably about three meters, 12 feet from them. And you can see they're not reacting at all. Now, a lot of you, I know there's some new viewers on YouTube. We haven't been seeing lions a great deal of late. So perhaps this is your first lion sighting. And if it is, I suspect you're sitting there wondering what on earth is going on? How can we be parked in an open Land Rover so close to Africa's most terrifying predator? Well, the answer to that is that they get used to the vehicles very quickly. They don't see us as human beings on the back of the car for some reason. I'm not sure how they perceive us, but you could certainly see when they were standing up there earlier, it was because they saw Brent and they perceived him very differently from me sitting on the vehicle. Not, I mean, we were much closer to them and they didn't even react to us. So I think they see the vehicle Although no doubt they can see our faces, they definitely see the vehicle in a different way to the bipedal human, which of course is the apex predator out here. And they get used to the vehicles and they pay us absolutely no heed whatsoever. So we can park this close to them, get wonderful close-ups of their heads, see the flies. They'll twitch their eyes and twitch their whiskers and twitch their ears to get rid of the irritating parasites that afflict them in the course of a hot summer's day. Now, Bill Burkett, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I've answered a question from you before, so if I haven't, thank you very much for asking a question. I want to know how much food a lion will eat per day. That's a bit of an injury there. That's probably from fighting over food. That is the lion's ear very close in. Then yeah, we might be able to get a close-up of the brain if you keep zooming in there. That's a bit far. That's a bit far, okay. Bill, it just depends. It depends entirely on what they've eaten before. So a lion can eat up to a quarter of its body mass in one sitting. A female lion, a big adult female, will weigh about 120 kilograms which in pounds is about 240 pounds. So a quarter of that would be 30 kilograms or 70 pounds of meat in one sitting. Now that is massive. I mean, that's a truly enormous amount of meat, but that would last a lion probably four or five days, if not more. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea of how much they need to eat each day. They definitely don't eat every day. They probably would if they could, but they don't have to. 
You can tell if a lion is hungry just by whether it has a fat belly or a thin belly. They don't lay on fat, so when they're in good condition, um, their muscles are full and their coats are shiny, but they might be skinny at the same time. from New Hampshire, Darlene. We were chatting about male lions earlier on, and you want to know whether the male lions born to a litter of cubs, or indeed maybe their cousins, born to two litters of cubs at the same time, do I think that they start to bond early on, so that when they form a coalition, a male coalition later on, when they leave the pride, it is stronger? I'm sure they do, Darlene. I'm absolutely sure that brothers are very closely bonded. I'm not sure that they do it necessarily because they happen to be, you know, they're thinking forward, or even that their genes are thinking forward to them when they form a coalition. But they certainly do form very strong sibling bonds. But remember that some coalitions, and I think that one of the Birmingham boys is unrelated to the other four, <clears throat> some coalitions can definitely form from unrelated male lives. And that, of course, gives us hope for Junior, Junior was the male lion who used to live with this pride. He was born to one of the Matimba boys some time back. He's about four now, and he's gone off on his own, and he didn't have any male siblings. And we hope that he will be able to find an unrelated male lion, perhaps an older one even, who will take him under his wing, as it were, and help him to take over a territory of his own one day. And I know we'd all like to see him again, but I hope for the sake of the genetic diversity of the area that we don't see him again, that he goes off and forms a territory somewhere far from his family. Ah, now, of course, one of the most conflicted stories that we know about lions, especially as people think about them as such noble creatures, we watched The Lion King, all of us. We've seen noble um, Mufasa standing on his pride rock looking after his family, and then suddenly we're told that lions kill their youngsters. And Bronwyn, you want to know why it is that male lions kill cubs. They don't kill all cubs. They don't kill, the, kill their own cubs. Well, they do sometimes, but very, yes, very seldom. When lions come into an area, Bronwyn, what they will do is kill all the cubs under a year old. And the reason they do that is so that they can try and take over, at least so that they can induce the females to come into estrus again and thereby bear their young. So a female lion who has a cub of less than a year old, of course, is not going to come into estrus until that cub is probably 18 months to two years old, even longer in some cases. And so if the male lions were to come into an area like this and there were a whole lot of little cubs, there'd be no females for them to mate with. And often, a male lion's tenure in an area is not longer than two years. So you can imagine, if this pride had a number of little ones, if a new pride of male or coalition of males came in, took over the territory, they might not mate at all. Now, that makes no evolutionary sense. So what ant lions do is they come into the area, they kill the cubs under a year old, and that induces estrus in the females. So that's the basic reason. That's a beautiful fly there you have there. That's my favorite. Yes. I think it's actually called a regal fly, that one. Yes, I believe it is, with the orange eyes. Yeah, that's him. I'll try and find a picture of him. Um, so, Bronwyn, that's why. And then the other benefit of that has, of course, is that it reduces the chances of inbreeding. Now, if... I'll explain how that happens. Let's take Junior, for example. Junior's a good example. He was a, he's now four. And he did start trying to mate with some of the females in this pride. Now, that means he could easily have produced offspring with his sister or with his mother. And a new pride of a coalition of males coming in to the area around about the time when the males of the pride attain sexual maturity, so around sort of three years old, they will then kill those cubs born of incest or born of inbreeding. Now, cats can deal with inbreeding for about six generations, apparently, but 
Obviously, the more genetic diversity they have in the population, the better it is for the population. So that's one of the sort of beneficial offshoots of the fact that male lions kill cubs when they come into an area. I'm going to try and find this fly for you. Fiam, don't make him embarrassed by... Ah, oh, here we go, I found him straight away. Oops. There we go. There he is, he's number four there. The copper-tailed blowfly, as far as I can work out. I'm just going to have a look at a few others, because a few of them have got those orange eyes, but I think the copper-tailed blowfly is a pretty good one. As they feed on corpses, well, lions can seem like corpses, and they also create nasty infections on some domestic stock. So I think that's what that is, but I'll try and just keep looking around. Now, Safari Dean, you want to know if these flies for, uh, give diseases. I don't think they transfer too many in the way of too much in the way of disease. They actually play a hugely beneficial role, flies. So they'll go and sit on a carcass, they'll lay their eggs, and the maggots will then eat away the carcass and eat away the bacteria and the meat that uh, sort of uh, might create infection, might create disease. So. I think they play a tremendously beneficial role. I don't know of any particular disease, do you, VM, that a fly could give you? They sometimes do lay their eggs. I mean, various species of fly will lay their eggs inside the skin of a human being, and then the maggot hatches under your skin, which, of course, is a very distasteful thing to happen. But I don't know of any flies that give diseases that are actually life-threatening at all. It's quite interesting. Mosquitoes, absolutely, they are a kind of fly, remember? A mosquito is a member of the diptera, or a kind of fly. So they are definitely nasty flies. Yes, that was either a regal blowfly or a copper-tailed blowfly. Let's go across to Brent Leo Smith at the moment while these cats are fast asleep. I'll sit here for a little bit longer, and if they don't do anything else, I think we'll probably move on and see what other interesting things that we can find. So, welcome back. We have the other primate that likes to climb trees as much as James Hendry and some impalas. Here they are. Hello, trouble causers. They often look guilty, and now that is a guilty face. That's a big male. There's a few more around, and some nice impala rams, a little bachelor group. And in the tree, Brian, to the left, another monkey, thinking we haven't spotted him yet. That tree, yep. They're absolutely incredible little animals and have incredible adaptability and often learn very quickly how to take advantage <laughs> of human habitation. As I say, they always look like they're guilty. They look like they've just done something wrong or they're about to. Let's try to sneak forward and see if we can find the big male. There's a whole bunch of them around us. You see where that big boy went, right? He walked off in this direction. Ah, oh, there he is sitting like the king of the castle. How's that, Brian? A little bit more? Speaking of a primate, Leo Pad is wondering why there are so few baboons in the area we traverse. 
Uh, well, yeah, it's mostly because we don't have a major permanent river system and they need those really big jackalberries and scotias, tree species, to, to roost in and to protect them from other predators. And they might have migrated out of this area because I know there used to be some. And I have seen one big troop of baboons in my area. Uh, actually, I've seen two, sorry. But for the most part, they seem to be towards the more permanent drainage lines that hold water for longer. It doesn't mean they won't occasionally meander into these areas. But it's just, at the moment, not ideal habitat, and especially with the lack of rain, it's even less ideal habitat. But we're gonna leave the, oh, maybe, maybe not. Let's see if it gives us a nice view through the gap here. Yeah. As I was saying, they're incredibly adaptable creatures. So a real omnivore, even though 80% of their diet is generally made up of vegetable matter, they'll happily grab insects, small rodents. They raid birds' nests for eggs and babies as well. And their greatest, probably, and quickest adaptation seems to be to human beings. Now, human beings are very messy feeders and we leave a lot of waste. Oh, he's gone hidden behind the bush there. And there are two animals in particular out here in the African savanna that for as long as there's been bipedal messy apes have taken massive advantage of that. And the one, or oh, sorry, actually three to be completely honest, and we're not gonna go into the rodents who also do, so actually there's a lot more. But out of the larger species, the monkey being the smallest, baboon is another one that loves to raid the messiness of humans. Now I wonder who can tell me what is the third that has got a very close association with humans uh, and or bipedal apes and their messiness and the amount of waste we leave behind. If you think you uh, know what I'm thinking and know what that animal is, pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. just sent us in. Her daughter is studying to become an orchid, a world orchid judge, and very interested in orchids, and says in South Africa we have 465 different orchid species, and most of them are endemic. And that is throughout the whole country. I know there's quite a few endemic orchids in the Western Cape that are specialized on feinbos, which is a very particular type of uh, shrubland that grows around Cape Town and the surrounds. But as I said, I know a lot of the orchid species in, in this part of the world are grass orchids. So we don't find them in trees. And the only common one that we find in a tree is the leopard orchid. Sorry, I just spotted a bird and it's an interesting looking one. Quite pretty. Unfortunately, that light's quite difficult and it's a golden-breasted bunting. You see the very distinct black and white stripes on the face, and you get, there we go, there's the gold. Now the female flew off, she's a bit more drab, and all the boys, and you can see he's preening, trying to make sure he looks the best for all the ladies. Oof. More than likely you see him cleaning like that. I just saw him come off the ground. He's probably just been feeding. And there are grass eaters, normally grass seed eaters, but they will also eat termites. And I think with the lack of grass seeds at the moment, a very good chance that he's got a sticky bowl full of insect and he's trying to wipe clean. Sorry, 
was 479, not 469 species of orchid, and 65% are endemic. Uh, for those of you wondering what endemic means, it means they only occur in South Africa. So that's an incredible amount of endemics uh, for an area. I think from a bird front, we've got about four endemics, complete endemics, and those would be, well, let's see if I can remember my bird knowledge now. Um, uh, Drakensberg siskin, Cape siskin, orange-breasted sunbird, uh, Cape sugarbird. I think that's all of them. I might have missed a few, but that shows you how in, a, in an area, the Southern Africa has, well, South Africa's probably got about 600, 700 species of birds, and there are only four endemics. But now out of 479, 65% of the orchid species are endemic. Thank you very much, Penny, for that. That is a nice little factoid I don't intend to forget. I'm almost tempting fate at my luck when Nikki and I were off the other afternoon and we happened to follow, see that cheetah chasing impala across quarantine on foot. So I'm just thinking maybe a little loop around in case he's come back to possibly nice open hunting grounds for him. we actually get asked quite often and Bram in the Netherlands would, would like to know what is my favorite place in Africa for a safari? Well Bram that changes and I think each of my favorite places in Africa each have their unique reason why I would like to go there on safari. Sorry I see a roadblock up ahead <laughs> and I think I wonder who it is. Well, they're on the move, so we'll carry on. So, Bram, I think for me, I, I have a, a particular affinity for the low south of South Africa, the greater Kruger area. It is, it is spectacular in a lot of places. Uh, you sit in this amazing bush and you look through and you've got the Drakensberg Mountains towering above you. And uh, for me, northern Botswana is also a very special place to me. Uh, the whole northern Botswana, so it's difficult to say the Okavango or the Kalahari, or, uh, but I really love that vast sort of huge swathe of land in northern Botswana. Uh, Zambia, another very special place to me. I've spent a lot of time in lots of different places in Zambia. The Kafui, the, the South Luangwa, southern Tanzania, the Serengeti, the Mara, the gorillas in Uganda, the rainforests in Gabon. They all have a very special place and I, I could not say each one is more favorite than the other because it, they each offer something unique and at different times of the year. And I don't know, but if I had to sort of say right now, with this big drought going on, where would I go? And that's a very difficult question to answer. I would say we're sitting probably in one of the best places with this drought, the game viewing that's gonna be happening over the next six months. Uh, the next place would probably be the Linyanti Savuti Kwando system in northern Botswana. And then another one that's way up there is the South Luangwa in Zambia. The game viewing is going to be spectacular. So ponder that for a while, bro. I can't actually choose one straight out like that. And while we continue to see what else we can find, I think we're going to go check on our naughty tracking team. I haven't heard from them in a while. Let's see if they've got any tracks of shadow. Uh, while we do that, let's go to James and some flat cats. Now I have to confess everyone that I told you a great and a dreadful untruth just before you left me last. And I said to you that I didn't believe that flies gave you any kind of bad disease. That is absolute nonsense. Uh, the common housefly, Musca domestica, for example, can give you the following delightful conditions. Cholera, poliomyelitis, leprosy, typhoid, and salmonellosis. Now that sounds 
or rather dreadful. The common blowfly, of which I think the one we were looking at is a member of the family, can also give you anthrax. So, not particularly harmless at all, really. I think you need to be careful of flies. Now, that one has clearly either got a hairball or perhaps some dust in her nose. I don't think it's anything too serious. She just seems to be trying to sneeze and failing. She needs to look at the sun. And every time, of course, a buffalo or a lion in this area goes, <laughs> people start going, oh, they've got TB, they've got tuberculosis, they have. And often that is just not true. They sometimes just get dust in their noses. And of course, we are in an area of bovine tuberculosis, which the lions have got in many areas, and for a long time we thought that they were going to sort of take out all the lions of the area, but that doesn't seem to have been the case. And while it might knock off one or two years in some of the lions, they seem to have coped very well with it. Lovely picture there of the nose, and you can see how it's changing from that pink to very, very grey and black. And by the time she's six, it will be completely black. Now, Sandra, you're in South California, which I've always thought sounds like a lovely place to live. Sandra, you want to know about the tailless lioness we saw a little while back. She's a member of the Salala Pride. Do we know what's happened to her? As far as I know, she's back on sharing, you know, knocking about Ottawa, Marthley, and Sparta, which are the two or the three properties to the south of us that border on the Sand River. That is their traditional territory and the fact that they were up here I think was merely a, a result of the fact that the Birmingham boys had come into the area they terrified the wits out of the Gahuma Pride and Gahuma Pride had disappeared into the Kruger Park and they'd left a kind of vacuum and so we had the Shimungwe Pride in here every so often and we had that Salala Pride come through every so often and they're the ones with the tailless female and I think she's doing fine down south of where we live now. Her mother I used to know when I was a guide in my younger years at Londolozi. And she also didn't have a tail, which is quite interesting. It wasn't genetic, they both just lost them. I think, if I'm not mistaken, to a hyena fight. <coughs> Excuse me. Dust getting in my throat as well. Perfectly coloured are these lions, of course, for a life in the bush felt here. You imagine how impossible that must be, a, be to see. As the sun goes down, it gets a little bit darker and we sit in the dusk. Can you imagine how impossible that color is to see? So I don't think we're gonna spend too much longer here. We've got only about 50 minutes left of the drive to go. Um, I'm gonna suggest what we do is we go off and just do a little circle around perhaps the Galago waterhole. There was some buffalo there. Let's go and have a look there. Maybe the Juma Dam Cam will go and have a look around there and then maybe pop back here. I don't think that they're going to move before it cools down substantially. And by the time it cools down substantially, I think it's going to be dark. So let's just try. We'll go off to the water hole here, have a look, and then we'll come back and see what we can find. These lions are doing, of course, what lions do best, which is, Liam? Lying. Lying, very good, and sleeping. So if nobody objects too strongly, we'll do that. And if you've got any more questions about lions, please feel free to ask them. We'll just do a loop around here. Of course, unfortunately, if they do move anywhere other than, like I say, directly in the direction we're going now, we obviously won't be able to follow them because if you look around us, we are surrounded by extremely thick bush. What right there, VM? Not going to run anything over? Oh dear, I knew there was a problem. I couldn't hear Kirsten because I unplugged again. Where is my pluggy thing? Who's it? I've lost it entirely. How is that even possible? There we go. Right, Kirsten, you may go for if you wish to speak with me. Now 
Now, Natalie, you're in England, and you want to know if one of the lions has cubs. Would we follow the same kind of sensitivity procedures as we would with uh, Karula, for example? We decided we'd leave her alone, and we wouldn't go near where we thought she had a cub. Uh, would we do the same with the lions? Uh, Natalie, yes, we would, to a certain extent. Certainly, we wouldn't be trying to track a lioness with cubs until they were at least sort of, until she was ready to introduce them to the pride. That's normally at about six weeks old, and so we'd probably leave them alone for six weeks. The other reason for that, of course, is that um, if you track a lioness and she's got cubs that are under six weeks old, she becomes quite, um, well, quite nasty, really. They're not great fun to track a lioness with six-week-old cubs. They tend to come exploding out of the bush at you, making a very loud noise, which is terrible. So yes, absolutely, we would observe that level of sensitivity. We probably don't need to be quite as sensitive with lions, simply because that they are, other than us, the apex predator out here, which means that the threat levels from other animals are just that much smaller. A leopardess, of course, is on her own. She's got no one to help her look after the youngsters, and so it's a little bit different for her. Run over here. Now, Mr. Moustache, our international man of a freezing mystery there in Iceland, uh, you want to know if male lions play any part in helping to raise the youngsters. Mr. Moustache, male lions do not play any role in actual raising, but the territorial male lion of an area plays an extremely important role in protecting the territory in which his cubs are growing up. So in that respect, he does play a role in parenting. Uh, he will have to look after the territory so that other marauding male lions don't come into the area and kill his offspring. So that is a very important role that male lions play. I'm just trying to get out of here with the least fuss. And the elephants have made such a mess. That's going to be difficult. So, very nice question. They don't play any kind of role in mentorship. They don't play any role in feeding their cubs. They don't bring them anything to eat. But they do play a very important role in protecting them from the depredations of other male lions. Yeah, I get the feeling I'm making a bit of a hash of this exit, don't you? I think you're lost. I think I'm lost. I'm definitely not lost, yeah. You need to cast dispersions on my directional sense while we're live. Now, Angie, you are in Wisconsin, and I love a question like this. You want to know if I've ever come across a lion or a leopard that's been born deaf or blind, and what has happened to that lion or leopard, and what would happen if one was born deaf or blind. Deaf, I suspect a lion might be able to survive for a short time. I mean, in exceptional circumstances, maybe even to adulthood. But blind, it would be dead within, or within weeks. Uh, you know, lions are not, they don't live in a particularly egalitarian society, which means that they don't kind of help each other out, which means if anyone is injured, sick, or infirm, the rest of the pride will just leave them behind. So deaf or blind, no chance, I'm afraid. All right, while we get underneath and out of this block, which I'm really making a hash of, let's go across to Brent and see what he's got to show you. Unfortunately, no tracks of that cheetah, no tracks of that leopard, no sign of the naughty tracking team. But fortunately, no booby traps on the route we were taking. So the last time the queen of Juma Karula was seen was quite close to this northern boundary. So I'm just going to take a peruse heading east have a look around, have a little listen. You never know what might be out there, and that's the joy of the bush. So I asked you.
you about what animal has a really long-standing relationship uh, in terms of raiding people outside of the vervet monkey and the chakma balloon. And well done, Safari Dean and Jordi, who got it correct, it is the spotted hyena. Other animals will do it, such as honey badgers, but in terms of sort of fossil evidence uh, of it carrying on and even depictions, cave paintings, uh, and hyena is the one that has probably been feeding off bipedal humans for as long, or bipedal apes, for as long as there's been a tool using bipedal apes. And not only feeding off our leftovers, but feeding off us in certain cultures and up until colonization, the elderly and infirm of a lot of the nomadic tribes were left with a gourd of water and a little bit of food and literally left for the hyenas. The true undertakers of the bush. Now those kudu are running tails up. Let's just listen for a second and they're not stopping and I don't think that's from us. Now we saw as those kudus dashed in front of us and white tail being prominently displayed. And that's another warning mechanism for the other kudu if there's a potential danger around. Let's just see if they were playing. They do, uh, I think they might have been playing. They've stopped, Brian. Hey, it was just some young boys playing. Uh, but it's always worth double checking those little, little telltale signs. Sometimes they can lead you to one of the big cats. There we go. They've calmed down. They could have just had a silly moment. Nice young male. Hold on. That, uh, sorry, guys, that just looked like a leopard crossing the road in front of me. Uh, quite far, could have also been a small hyena. It was quite far down the road, sorry about this, but it was crossing across our northern traverse boundary, and I just caught a glimpse of it going across. second ridge and just through this dip crossing about a quarter of the way up about there uh, it looked definitely to be a predator it could have been a smallish hyena uh, or it could have been a male leopard just judging from the size the more i think about it my instinct says hyena but still, worth taking these chances. There's a nice path. Nothing walking down there, Brian. Could have been a little bit higher, but it was somewhere around here. far away. That's why I sped so quickly. <laughs> Deborah, the armchair traveler, says, woo, I nearly fell off my couch. So definite, I'm going to go a little bit further and then I'm just going to switch off the car and roll backwards, but it definitely wasn't an antelope. Often with a lot of these circumstances now the more I consider it I think it was most likely a hyena but it was very far away predators definitely move with a different attitude attitude is probably the wrong word just a style of movement And the hyena den isn't very far from here, so it could have easily been a hyena. There 
you were just that few hundred meters too far. I would have said it crossed on this big game path coming up here, which unfortunately leads down into a drainage system. I'm listening and I can't hear anything. Just a white crown shrike off in the distance. Oh dear. There's the game path I was talking about. But Mother Africa does like to keep a few mysteries for us. There's always that split second half sighting of something possible. Unfortunately, we were just that little bit too far. Oh, I hate giving up. But I think we're gonna have to because it was going straight north across the edge of our northern traverse area. And just looking over down the road behind in case something doesn't decide to sneak past us there. I feel like they're out to get me tonight. Zoe and welcome on the back of the vehicle. Great to have you with us. Uh, Zoe is wondering, have I ever been fortunate in my travels to have ever seen a western lowland gorilla in the wild? Zoe, I in fact have. I've seen quite a few. I spent a year living just south of the equator in a place called Loongo National Park. And I saw western lowlands that it's probably that actually not probably have definitely never seen a person before on numerous occasions while i was there and here you see me tracking lions and leopards and wild dogs and cheetah following footprints but tracking western lowland gorillas was possibly one of the most humbling experiences for me is I had to almost learn over. You barely see a footprint with all that leaf litter in a rainforest. And uh, we used to track them by the strangest way possible. And of course, we used our ears. Sometimes you could hear the chest beats, especially if there were youngsters around, the little babies like to play and do little chest beats. Uh -huh. And Sometimes the big males would scream or bark. Oh, it's gonna fly, oh, off it goes. Sorry about that, there was a step buzzard, or a common buzzard, it took off just as we reversed back. So, Zoe, back to your question. So, the strangest method of tracking an animal. So firstly, uh, in the, the rainforest, one would assume it's just this plethora of food, but it's not. And the western lowlands have to move much bigger distances than the mountain gorillas because food is actually quite limited and they have a very specific diet uh, of bark, leaves and fruits. And they have quite large home ranges and they'll travel between specific trees that are fruit at specific times of the year. So during the dry season it was the easiest time to find them because they were pushed onto the Akaka swamps feeding off a tree called a vitex. And because they have such a specific diet, if you've ever seen a photograph of Western lowlands, it almost looks like they've got a beer belly, this big extended belly. Uh, and it's actually from their diet, they create an incredible amount of gas. And their, ga their gas has a very specific smell. And you often track gorillas by their flatulence. You would often find gorillas, obviously you have to put yourself in the right area to find those gorillas but you would track them via flatulence. So, very interesting. And a fascinating part of the world, the Congo Basin rainforests, and not too many people have been lucky enough to explore them as extensively as I have. Lots of incredible creatures out there, but also an incredibly difficult environment to live and work in. Sharon 
would like to know, rather than taking any safari, yes, on a Ferrari safari like we just did, is shooting down the boundary. Now, Clown, Sharon, well, that's a very silly question because the answer is a very emphatic and obvious yes. Uh, many years ago, uh, I actually lost a guest. He, he, he didn't listen. He stood up while I was Ferrari safariing after wild dogs and he landed on his bottom on the ground, uh, fortunately in nice soft northern Botswana sand and not impaled on a stick because that probably would have been a, a very short career for me. Fortunately he also had a sense of humour and surprisingly being from America he didn't sue me. But. Um, he thought good humor and actually that was the stage where my father decided to install seat belts into the vehicles and those were only engaged when chasing wild dogs and it wasn't so you don't fall out of the vehicle uh, well it was but it was to ensure people couldn't stand up when you were herring through the bush after wild dogs a smart man my father Huge Safari Live welcome to Will Stevens, who's a new viewer. And Will says, this is incredible. These guys can live stream a safari from the middle of Africa, yet his Wi-Fi will not reach his kitchen. Uh, I know, Will, I don't pretend to understand. We have a, a tall aerial thingy. See, when I get into these terms, I talk about thingamabobs and jigamajigs and what whats and whatnots. So we have a thingamabob on the back that sends a whatnot to another thingamabob on top of a hill that sends a thingamajig back to another thingamabob that looks like a satellite dish, which then thingamajigs all the way to London, which then jigamajags all the way to wherever you might be. So that's the best way I can describe it. And we're fortunate enough to have some incredible uh, minds who work with us and uh, they, fortunately, they don't get involved in tracking lions on foot. Uh, they leave that to us and we don't get involved in worrying about thingamajigs and uh, jiggy-majags. So you can see my headlights are on and that is just in case there might be a track. So even though I don't need to use a spotlight yet to see around me, I'm using my headlights to throw the light uh, as the sun would. So the main way we see the tracks of the different animals is because of the shadows. So the indentation, so we need a little bit of light to shine to show a shadow so we can possibly find the tracks. Of course, as the light gets lower and lower, it does become more difficult. This was the last area Karula was seen in. For those of you who are new, Karula is the dominant female leopard, uh, the queen of Juma. Uh, although the lion tracks walked through here yesterday on the sunset safari, so it's unlikely she's here now, but she does like this area, so she might loop it back. So while we continue uh, to search for other creatures out here, uh, James has moved on to the largest and sometimes most annoying of uh, human scavengers. I'm not sure why Brent described this as an annoyingly large scavenger, um, unless he was perhaps reflecting on himself, of course. Um, this is two beautiful little cubs. The one's born in December, so we've got D1 there with a little white tip to her left back foot, and then D1, at least D2 in front there, lying without any form of adult supervision. Where the adults are, I don't know. We had one adult when we arrived. She walked off, and she walked off with November. And these ones are just lying here, and I'm sure there must be an adult or two around in the bush. We left the lions, as you know, and just thought we'd come and have a quick look here. I'm very pleased that we did. I have only had one glimpse 
of the very small cubs that are still inside here, the January cubs. But they definitely won't come out without mum, who seems to be the matriarch of this clan. We call her Madam. I think she was so named by Jamie. Very good name, I think. Now, we had a question earlier on about naming animals and why we name them and do we name them and who gets to name them. Well, I just decided that we had to name these ones because it's so difficult to try and talk about the different generations if you have to say, well, the one born in December with the white foot or the one born in November to the one with the slightly pretty face with a scaffy left ear, something like that, of course, it makes it very complicated. So it's much easier if they've got some kind of nomenclature. And I quite like the idea of naming them after the month of their birth. Of course, until we get 12 months in and it becomes confusing when others are born in the same month. Isn't that wonderful? You can see the charcoal color of the birth fur still on the belly there, slowly fading into the spots of the spotted hyena. I don't think these things are annoying in the slightest. Do you find them annoying, Vian? No. No. We did have one, of course, and I'm sure Brent has told the story, who used to steal the Gorgonzola cheese wheel in the Londolosi Boma on a regular basis. Uh, she'd walk in during the meal, see that no one was watching, leap up onto the bu buffet table and remove an entire wheel of Gorgonzola like that. She came to be termed Gorgi, and of course, her um, dung could be smelled from 20 kilometers away. Brent is hailing me on the radio. She was quite annoying. Go ahead, Brent. We'll let you hear what he has to say. Are you planning if he's to not being rude. To um, Brent, we've got quite nice action here, so if you want to go back there, please feel free. So Brent will go and check the lions now. I think that's a good idea. He did, after all, find them on foot, so there's no reason he shouldn't spend some time with them in the car as well. Whiskey Bravo, you're worried about the ambient light here. You say it looks very low. It is low, Whiskey Bravo, and you're right on both counts. It is that the season is changing slowly. We are heading very slowly towards the conclusion of the summer. I mean, in this case, I don't think we can call summer over until May, but certainly the days are getting slightly shorter as we go along. And of course it is cloudy, so there is very little light coming out of the sky at this stage and I mean we're at half past six at the moment it will be completely dark by seven o'clock and that of course is normal for this part of the of the world we're at pretty uh, shallow latitude I don't always say this wrong low latitude which means we're relatively close to the equator we're really relatively close to the tropics which means our days and nights don't vary hugely. In the middle of summer, it'll be dark here by half past, at least winter, it'll be dark here by half past five. In the middle of summer, the longest day, it's dark by probably quarter past seven in this particular area. Not, does it go as far as half past seven? It doesn't ever push as far as half past seven, though. No. It'll be dark by quarter past seven. So we don't have those lovely long nights that you have at higher latitudes at these long days that you have at higher latitudes, or the beastly long nights that some of you have. I know various viewers come from Scandinavia, where uh, the thought of a winter in Scandinavia you know, chills me to the bone. Raid Freak, a very nice question about the termite mounds and what effect they have on the ecosystem here. And I like your question for the reason that it opens up a whole sort of subject of discussion. You say they fascinate you. They fascinate me too, Raid Freak. I think they're the most incredible things. And you want to know if they have any negative effects on the environment. 
Um, they don't, you know. Well, no, they've gone inside. Let's we'll sit here a little bit longer and hope that they come out again. Raid freak, they are coming out again. They, um, they have a very positive effect on the environment. The termites in an area make up more biomass than do all of the large animals. So the termites of per hectare here make up a greater biomass than do all the above ground herbivores. So that includes the elephants, the hippos, the rhino, the buffalo, the impala, the kudu, the wildebeest, you name it. Ter more termites than there are um, any other kind of biomass. Now that's important because it means that they are a keystone sort of, I don't want to say species because there are lots of different species, but they're a very key element of the ecosystem out here. And without them, things would be profoundly different out here and they would change completely. So they have a tremendously positive effect on the environment. Now remember, I mean, to say positive or negative in this context is perhaps a little disingenuous, simply because everything out here has evolved with everything else. And so if you remove one piece of that, everything will tend to collapse or certainly change profoundly. And so everything out here that has evolved has an effect on the environment. It'll be positive for some, negative for others, and there's always a balance constantly changing and shifting. It's called a dynamic equilibrium between the different species that are out here. The termites, though, are a massively, massively important part of the ecology here. Did you hear that knocking sound? I'm not sure what that was. So I don't think you did hear it there. It was just kind of a, ah, maybe a bit, maybe a buffalo knocking horns with another buffalo. Could have been, perhaps. I'm not sure what made that sound. Ah, now, Debbie, you're in Vancouver and you're worried about the fact that, well, maybe you're not worried, but you're interested in whether or not we'll be able to identify these youngsters without detailed spot identification patterns once they get older. Debbie, no, we won't, not unless we do have detailed spot patterns, uh, but those spot patterns that you can see will be maintained. Obviously, the spots will get further apart, but much like the old legend says, leopard doesn't stain, change its spots, nor does a hyena. And there are a number of viewers who've kept some incredible records of the hyenas here, and they can identify all, I think it's 17 hyena, adult hyena in this clan. And we are, I'm certainly not at that level. I, don't, I haven't studied photographs of all of them, so I wouldn't be able to identify them all. But certainly you can identify them as adults. They have unique spot patterns all over their bodies, which don't change over time. Nice question there, thank you. Like I say, Brent is heading towards the lions. I think we'll remain here for the next little while. And see what these see what these chaps do. You can see his lights. Hmm? You can see his lights. You can see his lights. So he's not far from here, everybody. He's just off there. Look, 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 look. You can see his lights in there. <laughs> so they're not far at all from the hyena den. That's fantastic. He gave us a thumbs up. <laughs> well, that was quite fun, wasn't it? Now, like I say, if those lions came across here, the little babies would just disappear inside and they'd be fine. <laughs> the Safari Dean, you say, I am, cannot possibly leave now. I'm officially the babysitter. I would be shirking my responsibilities. Fair enough. I take your point. We'll stay here in case those lions come up and see about what's going on here. We wouldn't want that. I'm not sure I'm a very good babysitter. I think my brother once left me with his son for a little while, um, but I became tremendously intimidated by the small human being. Now, Zilla, you're just 10 years old, and you want to know, you're obviously a very astute 10-year-old because you picked up that obviously even a predator like this must have predators. They do to a certain extent, Zilla, 
lions would be the only real thing that challenges a hyena. Not little ones like this. Little ones like this could be eaten by all sorts of things. If a leopard came past here, she would certainly have a go at those little hyenas. Uh, lions, absolutely. Maybe even wild dogs if they came across a, a den like this, unprotected by adults. But the little ones there would disappear inside very fast. I think it would be very difficult for any predator to get hold of them. You keep watching there, aged 10 Zella. Right, Leo Smith has managed to find himself some cats for the second time, this time in the car. Let's head across to him and see what the Nguhuma Pride is doing. So here we are with the Nguhuma Pride. Two that I could see have moved down into the drainage and there goes a third. So they are about to get on the move. Now, on our way in here, there were seven or eight buffaloes at the Gallego waterhole. I'm hoping the lions have heard them while they've been resting here and might move towards there. It is that time, oh no, back down into the near impossible to follow area. And just keep a look out from above if you see them go. I'm gonna use the spotlight. Oh, there we go. She's up. Well, let's wait till she. I'm just gonna get a hold of James in case they move to an area I can't get to. See if he can. Oh, sniff, sniff. James, James. She's just heard the hyena, but she's smelling lion urine, explaining the Flemin grimace. James, James. Oh, look at the stretch. James, they've just got mobile. They've gone straight into that drainage system to the north. Um, I've still got a visual of one. I don't know whether it should stand by further towards the north or not. I'll, I'll update you in about two. Well, we said that confirmed not getting towards Gallagher At the moment, I've only got a visual of one. The, the other four have gone down. I think they're just lying down probably 10 meters away. I just don't have visual at the moment. Oh, there's another one. Copy will do. Oh, they're coming back. Hopefully they do go towards the pan where the buffalo are. We could be in for serious excitement then. Hello, girls. David and Limby is wondering, don't they get irritated by the bright light? Quite fortunately, no, David. So, lion's eyes work in a very different manner to ours, and their eyes are actually designed to pick up light as it gets darker. So, I'm trying to plan my little maneuver here to try and get on top of this little ridge here so I can see down. That is not going to work. I shall be impaled by the fawns. Ah, oh, there they are, there's... Yeah, I just need to try to find a little gap, but they're sleeping down in the little riverbed. Oh, we've got danger, danger here. There's some artfark excavations can sometimes lead to your car collapsing into an underground hole. Okay. Mm. 
monkey oranges are quite thick here. Yeah? Let's see if we can maybe reverse into this little gap. I don't think we're going to get the best view, but at least we'll be able to keep tabs on them. See, they haven't snuck out behind me. I haven't. So, David, as I was saying, the lion's eyes work very differently. They only see in blacks and whites. Okay, I know what to do. That was what I sh should have done in the first place. So, the elephants have pushed over. Let's see if I can still see them. Ah, there we go. They are moving. Unfortunately, I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see them as well. They're heading straight towards the hyena den at the moment. And as I've lost visual, but if you have a look, you can see how high we are here. And that is probably about a three and a half, four meter drop. So even with my off road tenacity, I think it is a bit beyond what I can do. I'm trying to see if there's still one left down there. Let me just get hold of James. James, James. James, after that last hyena audio, it looks like they might be heading straight towards the den. I'm just going to... I'm going to do what I was going to do. There could be, I only saw one moving. And I just need to try a little trick. So, of course, I do not want to be attached to those very sharp hooked thorns of the Acacia nigrescens, also known as a knob thorn. But an elephant has broken down this branch here. So that one there. Instead of using my arm to move the branch, I'm just going to use the front bumper a little bit just to push it slightly out the way. We'll see if that worked. Maybe we can get a view from here. I think they have moved. I just can't see where they've moved to. It looks like I've... So it looks like I've just removed that dead thorn bush. You can see the other branch here is a little bush willow, which doesn't have any thorns. So this should just give us the chance to be able to see. Just make sure we don't drive off the precipice. Thank okay. you. The lions have gone and they have vanished. So that lioness we saw has moved off that way. The hyena den is in that direction there. So James is close to that side. So uh, let's go to James and see if he's had any luck on the opposite side. Unfortunately, there is two sets of drainage lines between us and them. So being lines, they might stop for a snooze halfway there. Now, we were thinking about going towards where Brent was, then the lions got mobile, and I think they've gone the wrong way, of course, because they're buffalo all over that Gallego pan, and they haven't gone there. Now, we're still, the hyena den is just off to the right-hand side. I'm not going to put a light on the den because it is now dark, but I will wait right here. The drainage line that they went into the lions is right behind us here, and there's a big game path that comes out towards the den, and we're just going to wait here and see if something doesn't pop out. And like I say, I would happily shine on the lions, but I'm not going to shine on the hyenas. Or certainly not on the cubs. So let's just wait and see what happens here. I'm just going to turn down the game drive channel, which is there and there. And so while we sit here, let's just sit here and wait. I'm afraid, of course, part, a big part of being in the bush out here is extreme patience. And um, we obviously can't get the vehicle into where the lions have gone. And I walked in there this morning. We actually came up this game path this morning. And so 
so we're just going to patiently sit by here. We'll show you that there is a bit of moon tonight. It's just over halfway, probably two thirds of the moon. And that is not great for lions hunting, but of course there has been quite a lot of cloud of late. So it's possible that the cloud will cover that moon and then it's ideal for the lions. Amazing how they move as it gets dark. And they did look hungry, as Liam said. They look pretty hungry. So if you don't mind, everyone, we're going to sit right here. There's not a huge amount to look at, of course. Don't have too much left of drive. Those lines might just change direction, go all the way up the drainage line towards Buffalo's Hook. Who knows? I think it's worth sitting here just to see what happens. I'm not, I'm not worried about the, how safe the hyena will be. I think they'll be fine. Leo Pad, a little bit earlier we were talking about Viam's cat that enjoys rolling in elephant dung and until I heard that I would have said you were exactly correct that leopards do roll in buffalo dung, fresh buffalo dung often. You said it's because it's before they go on the hunt. I've seen them do it when they're not hunting at all, when they're just marking territory. It might be to mask their scent. It could, I mean, I can't really think of any other reason, but I'm interested to know that VM's cat is prepared to, you know, really enjoy sort of elephant dung and possibly buffalo dung as well. So maybe there's some other aspect to it. Maybe there's some kind of um, bacteria in it that helps clean the skin. I don't know. I've seen elephants, at least leopards, eating fresh buffalo dung. So that's it. It is an interesting one. I haven't ever seen lions do it. You asked if lions will roll in buffalo dung. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think I have seen them do it, actually. I think that's quite interesting. I might have, but I don't remember it. It's certainly not something that sticks in my mind. So we're just going to sit here patiently. And let me be quiet for the next 20 seconds and see if you can hear the sounds of this summer night. cicadas here at this time of year because there's been no rain but there are cicadas actually living just above the hyena den there that's quite nice uh, well probably not so nice but to sleep there probably keeps them awake at night although that's normally when they are awake then one or two franklin's calling what have you got there yeah mm -hmm. just you just have hearing noises vm's hearing noises that's good they're just Franklins at the moment, one or two babblers, just calling their last before they go to sleep. They'll be roosting in a tree safe somewhere. And we'll just wait to see if the lion... Yeah, there's a contact call from a lion. Oh, oh. There. Yeah, they're moving up the drainage line. They're definitely moving north up the drainage line here. Let's see if we can get a view. They're in very thick bush still, but they might pop out at some stage. We'll just ease our way along the banks here. Keep looking behind us every so often. I'm not sure why there would be contact calling, to be honest, given that they can see each other and they are with each other and they look like they want to be hunting. Should we stick our noses in there? Yeah. You take a look. Yeah. Five minutes left, so we'll just have a quick look in here. We're not going to get a car in here in the dark. Just turn off again, see if we hear another contact call. There. They're right here. I suspect what we're hearing is them rolling on each other, kind of greeting just before the hunt. Further up. I can get the car. 
can't reverse, otherwise we'll end up in the drainage line with the lines. Probably not a bad thing. Anything behind us, Vimpy? anything there. I think they're using this drainage line as cover, everybody. They're walking up north. It's brilliant cover for a lion, of course. They might even be flanking it on either side. Hoping to flush something. Now, of course, all this dead bush that we're driving over because the elephants have had to eat so many trees this summer. Normally they'd be eating grass. Now they can't. There isn't any. Oh. There's no way to see into this drainage. Let's keep going along here. Let's turn off here and have a listen. Listen. I think just the woodland kingfisher and the litany bird, the fiery neck night jar going. That's a very dead tree, but it might break something. So we'll just keep going around it. I think these lines are not going to pop out here again. All right, we're going to keep driving along this road here and just see if the lines don't pop out. If they do, we'll come back to you immediately. But for the meanwhile, I think I'm going to hand you back to Brent for a calm and easy closing. But he did find the lines. So it's his privilege to say goodbye to you last. I hope you've had a good time on Drive With Us. I've had a wonderful time. Thank you for all your questions and comments. Thank you to Kirsten Lee and the Final Control. And of course to Viam again with his beautiful blue hat. We will hand you back to Brent and Brian, the two giraffes. And we'll see you in the morning at 05.30. Bye-bye. Those lines have gone into literally probably one of the most difficult areas uh, to follow them during the day, let alone at night. But fingers crossed for the Inkahuma girls that they have some success over overnight. And we've just made our way out onto the quarantine clearings. And as it's getting darker a little bit earlier, we are standing that chance when we do cross slightly into some of the nighttime animals space and the one I'm particularly looking for oh let's go there's a little scrub here hello little one at the moment is the white-tailed mongoose they have a den very close to the Juma pan and I've seen two of them go down a hole just before the beginning of the sunrise safari when it's still light. And this area was definitely be their favorite foraging ground. And they are the biggest mongoose species we get here. Quite incredible little carnivores. But very exciting to have the Nkumas back. Uh, but join us on the sunrise safari and hopefully we'll have them again.